Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our event tonight to celebrate the launch of Dr. Temple Grandin's latest book, The Outdoor Scientist. We're so thrilled to celebrate this book's birthday here at The Novel Neighbor. Um, for those of you either out of town or unfamiliar with our store, The Novel Neighbor is a locally run and independently locally owned and independently run bookstore here in Webster Groves, Missouri. Um, we are so excited that you're all participating in this event tonight and we're thrilled to have this conversation with Dr. Grandin. So just to give you a little outline of the evening, um, Dr. Grandin will be in conversation with a local St. Louis teacher, uh, Mindy um, Bouillon, and we are um, looking forward to Dr. Grandin's presentation, their conversation, and then we're excited to have um, everything open for questions. So be sure to comment with any questions you may have. We'll hopefully get to those in the Q&A session later this evening. So without further ado, um, some introductions for the evening. My name is Grace McKinney. I am a bookseller at The Novel Neighbor during the weekend. And during the week, I am a Montessori teacher here in St. Louis at Cheshire Montessori School. Um, and I was so excited to be a part of this event because, you know, as we were just talking with Dr. Grandin earlier, this book um, encourages children to get outside, and I'm all about that. So um, Dr. Timble Grandin uh, has a wonderful um, little bio. I'm excited to read about what she has done. Um, Dr. Timble Grandin is one of the world's most accomplished and well-known adults with autism. She has a PhD in animal science from the University of Illinois and as a professor at Colorado State University. Dr. Grandin was inducted in the National Women's Hall of Fame and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And in 2018, she was made a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Her work has been covered in the New York Times, People, National Public Radio, and 2020. Most recently, she was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of the Year. The HBO movie based on her life, starring Claire Danes, received seven Emmy Awards. Through conferences, lectures, and numerous books, Dr. Grandin advocates for a broader social understanding of autism, animal welfare, and the many different ways we can learn. Today, we are so thrilled to celebrate the launch of her newest books for young readers, The Outdoor Scientist, which will undoubtedly spark curiosity and enthusiasm for the natural world for all who read it. And tonight, Temple Grandin will be in conversation with Mindy Bouillon who's also an outdoor scientist herself, who brings her love for the natural world into her fourth grade classroom at the college school here in Webster Groves, where she's been teaching since 1996. Mindy holds a BA in elementary education from Webster University, where she has also pursued some graduate level work. Her devotion to Missouri's landscape has led her to research practices in sustainability education, and her collaborative work on this subject was published in the Society for Organizational Learning Education Journal in 2010. Recently recognized as one of Emerson's 2020 Excellence in Teaching Award honorees, Mindy connects her students to conservation and sustainability through trips to local waterways and collaborations with the Missouri Stream Team. So without further ado, I present Dr. Temple Grandin for tonight's presentation. Yeah. And one of the reasons why we went ahead and what Betsy and I worked on this book was um, when I was a little kid back in the 50s, and that was a long time ago, I liked being outside. So I wanted to really, uh, uh, because that's why we call it the outdoor scientist. We need to be getting kids outside. And uh, it's really a lot of fun. And I've never well, forget, my sister and I had a rock collection when we were maybe in like second and third grade. And we'd go outside and we'd find rocks and we'd bust them apart to see what they look like inside. And I want to emphasize, you got to wear safety goggles to do that. And we had our rock collections in the tool shed. Um, or we'd go make daisy chains. Those were things we did. Or we'd go find some old lumber and build a treehouse out of it. You know, just getting outside doing things. Another thing we'd do, we'd go to the beach. I'd collect shells. I'd make a mosaic out of them. I'd... Um, I, I remember taking uh, buds apart uh, to see how they formed, you know, various stages. I, I did that. Um, 
we have, we just got to get them outside, get them off the screens, get them outside doing things. And uh, one of the uh, projects you can do is go look at the night sky. And I was really intrigued by the uh, story of the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And the scientist who did that, NASA almost turned them down because NASA thought it was really crazy and kind of stupid to point the Hubble Space Telescope at nothing. That was his proposal. Point it at nothing right next to the Big Dipper and see what it found. And that's the famous picture I've got behind me, the Hubble Deep Space Field. There's hundreds of galaxies in that picture. So I had to put two things I liked on my refrigerator there, cattle and uh, the Hubble Space Telescope pictures. That was a really original idea to point it at absolutely nothing at all. Another project is an ethogram. And I had one reporter say to me, well, there's not much to study out there uh, uh, in, if you live in the city. There just isn't much. Well, I found just walking around my neighborhood yesterday, there was one great big huge black crow. And uh, he wanted to get a drink. So he went to a pothole in the middle of the road and they thought that tasted nasty. So he tried another place, a better tasting puddle. That was something I just watched yesterday. And then just a few months ago, I was sitting out in the gazebo right 10 feet from my front door. There used to be a tree there. A two foot snowstorm busted up the tree, so it's no longer there. And I watched a squirrel dig a hole, put the nut in the hole. It wasn't deep enough. So he puts the nut in his mouth and then he digs a little bit more like this and um, tries again, puts it in his mouth, tries again, finally got it deep enough and he buried the nut. Uh, there was bunnies on my front lawn. Another time when working on this book, um, I was out at our, our uh, experiment station and I was just sitting there and there was a little patch of grass with some morning glories and butterflies on it and I watched that. And then at four o'clock in the afternoon, the flowers closed up and the butterflies went away. That was just something in a patch of weeds. There's all kinds of things that you can go out and look at and do. And my mother used to just say, well, go outside and play and we'd find stuff to do. We need to be getting a lot more kids doing those sort of things. And there's some indoor projects, too. You can take sugar and make um, crystals out of it. There's some indoor stuff. But there's a lot of fun stuff outside. Now, another thing that I want to talk about, and I always talk about this in my talks, is different ways people think. I'm a visual thinker. Everything I think about, it's a picture. And when I was young, I didn't know that I always thought in pictures. In fact, most kids think in pictures. And that language kind of takes over. And being a visual thinker helped me in my work with animals. Because the very first work I ever did with cattle, uh, I looked at what they were seeing. And I noticed that when cattle went through the chute, they'd stop if there was a coat on the fence or maybe a truck parked next to the chute. They'd stop at little stuff that we just didn't even notice. Now, I didn't know at the time I was a visual thinker because I was doing this in my 20s. And uh, that made me pay attention to what animals were looking at. Because an animal lives in a sensory-based world, not a word-based world. Another kind of mind out there is the mathematical mind. This is the mathematical kid, really going to be good at programming. And then, of course, you've got the word thinkers. So one of the projects in the, in the book, the Outdoor Scientist, is um, uh, doing an ethogram. And that means observing an animal and seeing what it does. Um, okay watching a crow uh, test out which was the best tasting puddle in our neighborhood. That's just a really small ethogram. And then he hopped up on the curb and then he finally eventually flew away. Um, but you might do an ethogram for four hours. When I took an animal behavior class, I was instructed to do an ethogram for four hours. And since I worked with cattle, they wouldn't let me do cattle. So I did some antelopes at the, um, at the Phoenix Zoo. And I, some of the males would actually put their horns through the chain link fence and they'd fight through the chain link fence. That was kind of interesting. Now that was something that I had to, they didn't do it very often. I saw that like two and a half hours in. So if you just watch your cat for a few minutes, maybe he's sleeping, but some other day he's going to be some other times at night. That's when he's going to get more active and be doing things. So an ethogram is one of the projects, just watching what an animal does. Canada geese where I live have been really interesting. When I first came to Fort Collins 31 years ago, they always stayed in flocks. Then you start to see them in just little groups of maybe 10 or 15. And now I see single pairs of Canada geese all over the place. One might be up at the horse barn. Another pair might be on the front lawn at a bank. 
and they think they own the place. They walk very slowly across the street and then make the traffic stop with just single pairs of geese. Um, you used to not see that before. And I, so one time a female goose, she nested under the front door of our building and she hissed at everybody that came by. But then my student had one nesting and he made friends with her until the apartment manager didn't like it that she, he was feeding them. He had them landing on the balcony railing. I've got pictures of it. Um, but there's just all kinds of um, great things to observe. Well, I think now what I want to do is let's just open things up for questions because uh, an interview, because that's the stuff I really like doing. Well, hi, can you hear me? I sure can. Great. So um, I am Mindy Bouillon again, and Dr. Gannon, it's an honor to be with you. Um, when I was asked to moderate this discussion, I was so thrilled to get to do this. Um, so I got to take a look at your book and I um, wanted to share with you that um, I have shared with my students a little bit about you. Um, I teach fourth graders, so they're about 10 years old, nine and yeah. 10 years old. And um, when I mentioned your name, there were a few students who did know who you are, um, which was really cool for me to hear. And so they already knew a little bit about you, but um, they loved hearing about you and they loved hearing about some of the things that you experienced as a child and um, just the way that you were able to recognize your, your autism and um, use that as a gift and see it as, as, as a way to accomplish so many things. Just recently, when you just spoke, I think I heard you say the word um, observation many, yeah. many times. <laughs> um, I can remember a few years ago, I had a group of students and we were hiking and um, they kind of would get together these three or four kids and they would take these little notes and I asked them, what are you doing? And they said, oh, we're, we're members of the Close Observation Society. And they were just, yeah, and it was, they were just taking notes on all kinds of things. And so reading your book throughout um, the, the thing that I picked up so many times is just get outside and observe. And I loved that message that you're sending kids because I agree with you. I think kids need to be outside and there's a lot they can learn. Well, one of the things I've been looking at just little things to talk about, like this crow. Yes, see, I take a walk around the neighborhood. So I try to stay a little bit active and, you know, he tests the pothole in the middle of the road. He goes, ooh. And then he went to another puddle, maybe it wasn't quite as dirty. So he was going to drink out of that one. But there's all kinds of stuff like that you can just mm -hmm. you know, you watch in the neighborhood. And I was just looking up on the news, and the space station is supposed to be flying over. And in Outdoor Scientist, um, there's a you know website you can go to to find out what satellites you might be able to see. Because I can remember as a child uh, going across the street to the field next door to our house. We were going to try to watch Sputnik. Yeah. Only problem is all we got to see was their ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you mentioned the light pollution, and that is um, more and more of a challenge to see the night sky, for sure. Well, it's a problem. You can't see it here, because I can remember when the Halbach Comet was out there, and driving back from the airport on the dark highway, uh, I could see Halbach. Then when I got home, no, I was not able to see it. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's a problem. Uh, uh, the night skies at my aunt's ranch, you could really, really see the night skies. But here, where I'm at now, you just see, you know, some of the big stars. Now, somebody was asking there about um, why cattle. Well, when I was a teenager, I got exposed to them. This brings up another very important thing about where students, what students are going to get into. It goes back to what they're exposed to. And I'm concerned that a lot of ex students aren't exposed to enough different things to find things that they'd like to do. When I was in fourth grade, I was using a screwdriver, hammer, pliers. I also have another book, Calling All Minds. That's got my aviation experiments in it and my parachute experiments. And I'd cut coat hanger wire to make a cross beam like this to make the parachute open up better. And I had to tinker with that. And I was using tools to, to do that. I had to make a dent in the coat hanger with the pliers and then I'd bend it like that when I got to break. But I got exposed to cattle as a teenager at my aunt's ranch. If I hadn't gone to my aunt's ranch, I wouldn't have gotten interested in cattle. 
I'm worried that a lot of kids aren't getting exposed to enough stuff. I think taking out all the hands-on classes, worst things the schools ever did. Yeah. Well, when I, I, I took my kids out to the woods yesterday and I brought your book along with, with us. And right before our hike, I read to them, um, one of the things I love about your book as a teacher, and this is something that I just think resonates with kids, is that in every, well, all throughout the book, you just have all these little stories of your childhood peppered throughout the book. And um, a lot of your stories remind me of my own childhood, just oh. going inside and playing with the whirly gigs of the maple trees. Oh, we did that, and we'd stick them on our noses, too. <laughs> I never did that, but... Yeah, like, and then we just stick them on, like, stick them on the bridge of our noses, and then we'd spin them. And all uh -huh. people made daisy chains. That was something we do. We'd take a blade of grass, put it between our fingers like this, and go... And it would make a whistle. Yeah. That was another thing we did. Yeah. Well, I read to them the part about how you, uh, it's kind of towards the very beginning, I think it's in the chapter called The Woods, and you talked about how being inside was, you know, reading and learning and really yeah. difficult. And um, and I got to the part where it said, after a long day of school and then working on skills or drilling with my mother plus chores, getting to go outside meant one thing. And I stopped there and I said to the kids, what do you think Dr. Grandin wrote? And one of the kids in my class said, freedom. <laughs> and I said, that's exactly what she wrote. And so I think that kids still have that um, today, that they, they want that. And well, I need some unstructured time. And one of the problems I'm seeing, especially with some of the autistic kids, is video game addictions. They just, they're not going into the video game industry and getting great jobs. And somebody, as Stephanie just wrote on here about Asperger's syndrome looking for mm -hmm. employment, which was basically autism with no speech delay, socially awkward. Mm -hmm. You need to start teaching job skills young. How about volunteer jobs? Farmers market, church, community center, walking dogs for the neighbors, where you're doing something where somebody else is the boss. They've got to learn that and get them into real jobs. Now we got to be careful about uh, crazy multitasking. Don't put them on the super busy, crazy takeout window. Mm -hmm. That's going to set them up for failure. But ice cream shops have been really effective. Mm -hmm. uh, the supply store was another one that worked really well. Fairly quiet. In an ice cream store, you do each customer individually. And and it isn't you know quite so, so much multitasking. And I've had parents say that, well, he blossomed in that job. You know, we've got to, they've got to learn how to work. Um, I was a horrible student in high school. I got kicked out of ninth grade for fighting and throwing a book at a girl who bullied me and went away to special boarding school and they didn't do much studying for the first three years but i cleaned a lot of horse stalls i yeah. basically ran the school's horse barn mm -hmm. I how to work really important thing for me to learn how to work yeah and you i've heard you mention several times for parents and for teachers to really um again observe their own children whether they're 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 their children they're, of their parents or their um their students and really notice what what makes those kids tick? What makes those kids really want, you know, what, what turns them on? And for you, it was animals. And for you, it was nature. And for some kids, you know, it's building or, you know, making things, but to find those things, because in your book, you mentioned when you worked in the horse stalls, you would do anything to keep that job because it was so important to you. Well, and also it gave me a real sense of responsibility because I fed them. I put mm -hmm. them in and out of the barn and I had to clean and bed the stalls. There were nine stalls every day. And and it took a couple hours every day for me to do my horse barn chores. Yeah. And I also was proud of the fact that basically I ran the school's horse barn. I did I didn't buy the feed. I didn't do the financial stuff, but everything except financial I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I see a good question. What's the weirdest animal behavior you've ever witnessed? I went and visited my friend, and uh, her cat would take clothing wad it in a ball and try to mate with it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I when, thought that was pretty weird. And he'd, he'd smack, you know, he'd, like you know, if he got a hold of your t-shirt or something like that, he'd squash it or a towel. He'd smush it all together in a big mound. And that, yeah, is weird. that was weird. And, and I, uh, I made sure he didn't do that to any of my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was really weird. And that actually happened. I saw it. I wasn't told about it. I actually saw this behavior. Yeah. Um, 
one of the other things I noticed in your book that I really loved is that in each chapter you highlight kind of a little mini biography of different people in um, the, the topic of the field that you are mentioning in, in your book. Um, and often the people that you're mentioning are people that maybe weren't always as recognized. That's right. And they were people, um, there's been a lot of, um, you know, people of color that have not gotten credit for things. I've, our, I get, I subscribe to science and nature. They're two premier, I remember reading an article in there about a, a black scientist and he, I'm trying to remember, he discovered something really important with genetics mm -hmm. and is now getting some credit for it. Yeah. I know just recently we all um, heard about um, Katherine Johnson because yeah. of the, the movie that came out. But before that, people, you know, they didn't know her story. And I just think it's great that you chose really carefully some people to highlight in your book. Well, and I think and there's some, Katherine Johnson's an interesting story. Now, I'm a big NASA geek. And like I've been to Cape Kennedy. I got to watch SpaceX launch. I've been inside the vehicle assembly building. I've been in the wind tunnel at Ames. I've been in all kinds of cool places. I didn't know about Katherine Johnson until that movie came out. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that movie did a did an excellent job. But some other interesting things about Katherine, there were some things done right with her education when she was young. She was moved ahead in more advanced math. And I'm seeing a lot of kids that are smart in math and they're not moving them ahead. They're not learning programming. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Katherine Johnson had horrible discrimination. But as a young girl, her math was moved ahead. And that was really important for her, you know, for her being successful. And she hand calculated all the orbital mechanics for our first orbital, you know, for the first orbital flights and the suborbital flights. And uh, this is back in the days when computers had punch cards. Yeah. Computers were actually people who computed. <laughs> they were people. That's the yeah. thing. And, and, um, and here, here in outdoor scientists are buds that in different, I had to make sure these pictures got in here because uh -huh. I would take these buds apart, different stages of development to kind of see how they, how they developed. Yeah. Here's another thing I did. Um, yeah. But I'm um, finding now I'm just really paying attention to things like the squirrels. Unfortunately, the squirrel nut thing after the, I saw that after the book had gone to the printers. And the same thing with the crow. That was yesterday. <laughs> but just, uh, you know, just get out. There's a lot of stuff you can observe. Yeah, it would be fun to have a, a place where kids can maybe type in some things that they've observed after being inspired by your book, too. Well, one of the things that's bad, like where I live, there's a beautiful big field between my condo complex and the school. And in the 50s, that would have been full of kids flying kites and stuff. I never seen any kids there. We got lots of kids in our neighborhood. And um, they'll go out and like maybe go on a family outing on their scooters or their bikes, but you don't see them outside at all. I haven't seen a child in that field since I've lived there and it's nice and far away from the road. It's, uh, well, my mother would have thought that would be a perfect field for us to go in. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And that's, and that's really tricky because, um, I was just talking to somebody about that, how, you know, even when I was a kid, um, more like in the 70s, we yeah. were, you know, on our bikes and in our neighborhood and our parents didn't really know where we were. And, um, you know, I don't think that's the case anymore. Well, well, I mean, I'm seeing like fully verbal kids that are teenagers with autism, you know, fully verbal, doing well in school and they've never gone shopping by themselves. Yeah. They're not learning basic schools. We've got kids growing up without tools. We've got a gigantic shortage right now of people in skilled trades. And I was glad to see that one of the news shows gave the tug crews some credit. They need to be given credit. Those ships had those tugboats had to work in unison to get that ship out of there. She's on the way to Rotterdam. I checked it up. There's a there's a <laughs> website. I can track where she's going. She's going now because she's got a super important container of bedroom slippers that have to be delivered. <laughs> that I read about uh, that this person really upset her bedroom slipper shipment was delayed. It's <laughs> one container out of 9,000 containers. Yeah. yeah. Stuff like that, but there's, you have some very skilled people there that need to be getting credit to get that ship out of that canal. That's, I've worked on a lot of stuff out in the industry. 
I'm going to estimate that 20% of the people with patents that own metal fabrication companies were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And I'm saying that seriously. Mm -hmm. And half the programmers in tech, they're, they're, the, they're the mathematical minds. Yeah. Well, and I think that's so refreshing to, to hear your stories um, and for kids, to, because there are all different kinds of minds. I mean, of course there are. And so um, to hear that that isn't something that has to hold you back at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite of that is, is really great for kids to hear. And I mean, I know when I talk to my students about you, they just immediately, they want to know more about you because um, they recognize that. They recognize that they think differently and that their friends do. Well, the thing that was really weird, I was all through my 20s, I didn't know I thought differently. See, all through my 20s up to my early 30s, I thought everybody thought in pictures. Mm -hmm. And it was a shock to me when I learned that they didn't. You see, there's research now on the object visualizer and the more mathematical mind. Well, they call That's called the visual spatial, the more mathematical mind. And the object visualizer is me. There's research. But, of course, none of that was going on. And I was shocked when I asked um, a speech therapist about something that you don't own, like a church steeple. Now, I just see specific ones. They sort of come up like PowerPoint slides. And all the speech therapists saw was that. Yeah. I'm going, there was almost no visualization there. I was shocked. Yeah. Then I started questioning people. And I started reading more. And then I finally figured out the three kinds of minds. And then when I did my autistic brain book, that was probably back in 2013, I discovered the research that done uh, on the object visualizer and the mathematical minds. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people are kind of mixtures, but there really is different kinds of minds. And I worked with some brilliant um, visual thinkers and we're losing some skills on building things like the top of the line electronic chip making machine mm -hmm. and um, state of the art poultry processing plant and the glass walls in the Steve Jobs theater and the Apple headquarters. That's all important. Italy, yeah. Germany. We don't know how to make it. I've heard you talk about Steve Jobs too and, and describe him as an artist. Well, that's why the phone's easy to use. Yeah. Okay, StreamYard and and um, and uh, Zoom have gotten all the business because you don't need a PhD in, in programming to figure out how to use it. Oh, I did have a little lo weird login thing on this. I don't know why I had it. But um, it's, <clears throat> you see, there's two parts of the design here. The visual thinker makes the interface and the mathematician has to make it work. You have to have both. Mm -hmm. And Steve Jobs made a phone that'd be easy to use, but the programmers had to figure out how to make it work. You need both kinds of minds. Yeah. They have complementary skills. And I'm worried that stringent algebra requirements are screening us out. I've never have passed an algebra class. I managed to get out of it. It wasn't required in 67. Yeah when I was a freshman and I had to be tutored through statistics. Is your concern the reason why you kind of shifted your um, focus in writing more towards books that are geared towards children? Well, yes, I am because I'm I was shocked. I went to a state of the art. Um, a lot of my work on equipment design has been catalyst, the biggest thing. And I went to a pork plant three years ago looked out on, and I have a slide I show in some of my talks, all this fancy equipment, it's all imported, high-wage countries. You're not talking about bedroom slippers. <laughs> no. that We're not talking about, we're talking fancy, expensive equipment. I, I call it the clever engineering department coming out of a high-wage country. And and we're losing skills. We're not making the state-of-the-art chip-making machine. And you look at things like the Mars rover. Um, I looked into the cameras. Hand-done wiring. Uh, Perseverance has taken some selfies to show off her hand-done wiring. <laughs> That's a one-of-a-kind thing made in a shop. Uh, let's. Um, I noticed on the little um, helicopter, the little drone that it has. Yep, it's got a smartphone chip. It's got a Qualcomm smartphone chip. That's fine. Got all the electronic specs. But that thing was made in a shop. Yeah. Let's give some credit to, and it wouldn't have been made by 200 people. No. Not something that small. Yeah. Um, let's give them credit. It's good that the, you know, okay, we've got a smartphone chip in it. 
that's fine. Give it credit. There's some other satellite that went out to the far end of our solar system that has a, a video game chip in it, one of the old ones, because it was super reliable. Mm -hmm. But I've been in some of the shops where this stuff is made. <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, let's see, I'm seeing a few questions. And so I want to make sure that people's questions get answered also. So these are a little bit different topic. Um, can you talk about your favorite tools to use outside? Well, when I was real little, it was a hammer. I liked, you know, busting the rocks. <laughs> I want to see what they look like inside. I liked that. Um, a saw came, a small coping saw came in fifth grade. And I've discussed that in the Calling All Minds book. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really liked uh, pliers. I would bend coat hangers and make stuff out of them. Um, that was stuff I liked. Our next door neighbors had the old fashioned kind of with, um, you know, with little bolts. And I liked playing with that. You know, kids mm -hmm. are growing up today totally separated from the world of the practical. I don't think that's a good thing. Of um, them hurting themselves and. You know, I can remember whacking myself with a hammer sometimes, and then you don't do it anymore. <laughs> well, you're gonna be more careful next time. Yeah. I did that too. Yeah. Um, I have a question about, um, it says, camping is a great way to unplug and let kids be wild and free in nature. Do you have suggestions about camping? Well, I, some kids are gonna love it. Some might not love it. You see, but this gets back to exposure because you also need to find out stuff you don't you don't love. I didn't know as a, as a teenager, I did not like camping because I have trouble sleeping anyway. But another kid is going to actually love it. And that's why I'm finding with careers and many things, I'm very concerned that a lot of kids aren't exposed to enough stuff to find out what they might like. I went out to a great little summer camp they had for autistic kids in Kearney, Nebraska. And they were getting these kids out on these small boats. And some of the moms going, you mean you got my autistic kid on a boat? You got to be kidding. And he liked it. You know, it's getting him to try different things. And then he might find stuff you like to do. And then you might find some stuff you don't like to do. But you don't know until you try stuff. Um, and yeah. I grew up in a time where uh, when I was in elementary school, I had art. I had sewing. I had woodworking. If I hadn't had those classes, I would have hated school. Yeah. And for some yeah. kids, I mean, they're going to just love camping. You know, you've got to. Uh, you got to try it. Yes. And I have found even kids who don't love camping, um, they feel proud that they made it through the night, even if it was hard and they didn't love it. Well, that's just, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And then there'll be something about it they're going to like. Yeah. You see, that's, um, um, but I'm worried they just don't do enough stuff today. Yep. Even if it's, they can tell people how, hard their camping trip was. <laughs> well, they, they, it was, um, you know, hard as a rock. Um, the one tool I had that I thought was fun as a kid was an egg beater drill that you, oh, yeah. you know, now you've got battery operated drills that um, I, I can't believe the torque those things I've got in terms of uh, screwing a screw in. Mm -hmm. They're really different than the things that I was using. Yeah. I think that that is that is good exposure. Um, favorite book um, when I was a child, my two favorite books were Black Beauty and the other favorite book was Famous Inventors. Those were my two favorite books when I was in about fourth grade. You mentioned the, the Swiss Family Robinson also in your book and yeah. kind of some fantasy play with that and coming up with the what if scenarios. Yeah, but so I'm. Um, just like we got to get kids doing things. I know in your Montessori programs, they do a lot of hands-on things, mm -hmm. but I'm finding I'm, you know, we've got, I had a student that never used a ruler. They're not doing protractors. Um, I remember going to an elementary school about 10 years ago and the kids were studying shapes. Now we had to draw them when we were kids. No, they just had to look at them. <laughs> yeah. It's a different, it's a different way of thinking yeah. about it when you have to draw them. Did you draw a lot as a kid? Oh, I drew all the time. And and I had a tendency when I was real young, like in third grade, to just do the same horse head over and over again. My mother encouraged me to draw more things, try different media. Mm -hmm. In other words, expand it. Expand yeah. the, um, the skill. You know, uh, 
so it's not so fixated on just one single thing. Right. Um, the illustrations in the book, just these little guys here. Yeah, they did a really nice job with the illustrations. So, yeah, I was going to ask if that was you or the publisher. No, no, it's not. It's a, now there's a few. Um, uh, well, on the Calling All Minds book's got a few illustrations I made, but no, they hired an illustrator to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, oh, I'm just looking right now at the picture of Katherine Johnson. That was, um, yeah, and then I've got a picture yeah. of, uh, got a picture of me on the beach in here. Yeah. I saw a few of you. Our family didn't have, I mean, we weren't that big on photography. So, well, it was a, a few pictures. Yeah, it was more of an ordeal, too. Well, the, and it was expensive, too, and you had to send the film in and, yeah. and I just, uh, I can remember when the first Polaroid came out, but the pictures didn't last. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the little stories that you have all throughout the book about your childhood, and you also mentioned your sister, um, did you, I mean, you say, you know, you talk about being, a, um, you know, very, very visual, but your stories are also, you know, it takes kind of a, a verbal memory for those. Did, did you, um, did those come up pretty quickly for you? Did you keep a journal as a kid or did no, you? No, I didn't. Like one picture we got in there of uh, making sandcastles where we just dribble the sand through our hands. Mm -hmm. I loved doing that at the beach. And then another thing we did, because in the summer we were on the beach, uh, we get this real thin seaweed, <coughs> put it in a bucket. And then if you got a piece of cardboard under it just right, it would stick to the cardboard and then dry to the on the cardboard. It was real thin, filmy, green seaweed. Mm -hmm. uh, make like cardboard art with that. Yes, so you, mentioned, you mentioned the treasures you would take home to your parents' house. <laughs> To, so you had your little collection of rocks and shells and yep shells we took those things home mm -hmm. uh, you know you know stuff we found on the beach one time i found a lawn ornament on the beach that was a bird with whirly wings <laughs> i thought that was just wonderful <laughs> yeah um let's see we have a question about um Uh, somebody who lives in a crowded city and what are some of the kinds of things that kids can do as an outdoor scientist in the crowded city? Pigeons. Pick out one that's got unique coloration and and just sit on a bench and watch what it does. And you and in an ethogram you go, okay, it's standing still, it's flying, uh, it's walking, it's pecking the ground, maybe eating something. It, um, you know, maybe had a little fight with another bird or something. What does it do? Mm -hmm. You know, then does it fly away and then come back at a certain time? You know, there's some pigeons that have real distinctive coloration, and you could uh, just pick one out and, and uh, watch. There's a lot more things that you can see than what you think. Yeah. Yeah, there's some some small little gardens I think you can plant, too, and maybe... Well, well, yeah, you can do things with gardens. Um, in fact, um, uh, the gardening places, uh, they had did a booming business during COVID and Home Depot, uh, they did really well because, you know, people were remodeling their house. Mm -hmm. But I had a reporter ask me, well, there's not going to be anything for the kids to see in the, in the city. Well, there's a lot more than you can, there's a lot of things. Mm -hmm. They just have to look. Yeah. And you could go to um, the parks. Yep. And there's a lot to see with cloud formations, too. Cloud formations, absolutely. Different mm -hmm. you know, cloud formations. That's another thing you can watch. Yeah. And they can change, you know, really quickly. Yes. Yes. Um, let's, things they can do. We have... Um, a question that says, though this book is directed toward younger readers, do you also encourage your college students to spend time outside in your courses? 
Well, one of the things that's done with college students and animal behavior, and it was done with me when I took a college animal behavior class, is we had to find an animal and do a four-hour ethogram. And uh, my behavior teacher said, didn't want me doing cattle. And so I had to find something else, Phoenix, Arizona. And I went over to the zoo, and they had um, antelopes. Uh, in, in, uh, I chose them because they were in a bigger enclosure. And I sat there for four hours, and I watched them. And I watched them stick their horns through the chain link fence to fight then and they were in separate pens but yeah. i wouldn't have seen that behavior if i don't watch for 30 minutes you see you have some behaviors that are really important but they don't happen that often mm -hmm. behavior like sleeping now yeah, you spend a big pile of time doing that yeah yeah so as a scientist it's important to write down dates and times well, we and also had to, you know and the assignment was we had to sit for four hours and then and then put it on the clock on the you know what the animal was doing mm -hmm. yeah and they didn't they didn't want us doing cats and dogs either you know they yeah. put some limitations they uh, but that was an assignment that was a college assignment that i actually did yeah and I had been in that zoo a bunch of times, and the uh, antelopes were in a great big, huge pen. And uh, I figured I'd see better behavior than some animal that's just in a small enclosure and it's pacing. I don't want to watch that. Yeah. Because I knew that was an abnormal behavior. Because mm -hmm. I'd already had an undergraduate animal behavior class. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a sign of stress, I would imagine. Well, it's boredom. They're just doing yeah. stereotypies. Um, and the animals that tend to be really bad about doing it are the ones that, that in the wild there, they travel long distances. Yeah. And they become the pacers. And then your grazing animals, they tend to get mouth stereotypies, chewing things. And mm -hmm. well, you got to enrich their environment and you got to think about what does that animal do out in the wild? Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, that was an assignment. Mm -hmm. And basically, that assignment's in outdoor scientist. Yes. I mean, kids can do this assignment, but upper level college students are doing it too. Absolutely. There's a lot to learn in this book. What was your, um, were you picturing this book um, to be like a classroom teachers using it or parents or just, I just you know, just everybody, teachers using it. Um, my previous book on calling all minds, which is more things I made like parachutes and airplanes, kites. Um, um, I did a talk at a big homeschooling conference and they got really interested in it. Mm -hmm. And, and none of the things in either one of these books is expensive to do. Yes. That's a great point. I noticed that, all the projects in here, you've got building a tent outside with just a sheet and just a sheet. I mean, I want something where where I don't want people saying, well, you got a whole bunch of expensive stuff. I've done a lot of autism talks in very low income areas, and I want to make sure they're things that they could do. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like that was that came through very clearly in your book. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of projects that are really exciting. And I loved your um I'm really excited about your rocket project. I have done um, uh, like water bottle rockets where you just you do air pressure. Yeah. Yours has uh, the baking soda. Well, and those are things, again, it's not an expensive thing to do. Uh, you mm -hmm. Younger kids want some adult supervision for that. Yeah. But there's, um, I would just spend hours tinkering with this little kite uh, that wasn't any, any bigger than this. And I was flying it when I first started behind my trike. <laughs> and I spent hours tinkering with it. I remember doing it. Yeah. And weighting the wings with different amounts of tape. And then I'd go try it. A lot of kids today are scared to death to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes back to not doing real things. Because one of the um, projects in the Calling All Minds book was just a paper snowflake. The simplest things. And I had a teacher ask me in all seriousness when I held up a paper snowflake on a Zoom conference. She said, well, what's going to happen to the kid's self-esteem if the snowflakes cut wrong and it fell apart? I said, you get another piece of paper from the printer, you try again. And maybe you look it up on YouTube. And I think some of this is they're too far away from, from just practical things. 
when I did a book signing for that book, that was three years ago, I found out that 20%, maybe 30% of the kids, elementary school kids outside of Denver, in a you know, kind of a sur suburban part of town, had never made a paper airplane in their life. Mm -hmm. I am not kidding. This is stuff I found out that I was kind of shocked at that. Yeah. And when they started making them in this big theater and chucking them off the balcony, they had a real good time with that. Yeah. Yeah, they do. This is the simple, really simple stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, you're going to have a bad self-esteem because a paper snowflake didn't work. Right. Uh, I remember wrecking a sewing project when I was about 12 or 13. I cut the fabric wrong and oh, well, I wanted to be more careful next time. Yes. Ruined the project. I had to throw it out. Yeah. So I could. There was no way to buy more fa fabric. It was a remnant. Right. I think that's a great point. Um, let's see. We have a question. My high-functioning autism daughter has started writing a book. What advice would you give young writers today? Well, one of the things I had to learn is, you know, you need a good editor because as a visual thinker, I tend to ramble. My thinking is associative. Verbal thinking is much more linear. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably, and the other thing, you know, when you're writing a book, there's a, you want to like figure out who's the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, you know, you start out writing it, but one thing you have to learn in writing a book is you've got to be able to accept having an editor mark it up. And usually it's going to make a better book out of it. Yeah. I think that's good advice. And there's been, um, been some people, I, I, I love that book, the, that movie in the book, The Martian. Yeah. And that started out as a computer programmer's blog. And, and he got sick of sending copies out to people. So he goes and puts it on a 99 cent Kindle mm -hmm. and it comes off. Yeah, I read that book a few times and I, um, and I love that story. Unfortunately, as a fourth grade teacher, there are some words in that book. <laughs> uh, I, yes, uh, there definitely are some words in that book. That I'd have to edit out a little bit, but the story is amazing. I mean, it's really entertaining. Well, the thing that's interesting about that is most of the stuff that he did, you could actually do. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the end thing with the rocket. I think that was a bit of a stretch. But what he was doing with solar panels and growing stuff, um, because a lot of um, uh, NASA scientists would write in and critique whether it was scientifically accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was because it was a blog, right? Like yeah. Yeah, it, it was just a blog to begin with. And I know that there's some people on the spectrum that have written some really good science fiction and science fiction fantasy stuff. And you just start out, once you start with a short story, because that's going to help prevent the rambling the problem. Make an outline mm -hmm. and write a short story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had some writing skills today are awful. The gotten graduate writing skills in today's college students are really atrocious. It's gotten really bad in the last five years. I have to correct grammar on graduate student journal articles. Mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm not the only professor to be complaining about that. And I find out what you do in school when you were in high school. Never wrote a book report and never had a teacher mark up the work and correct the grammar. Yeah. I, I thank the teachers who marked up my work. Because writing was a really important part of having a good career. As I do these projects, and then I wrote about them. Mm -hmm. and, when and when you're different, what you need to be doing when you're kind of different is here's some of my drawings of um, cattle facilities I designed. Yeah. And what I learned is when you're different, you sell yourself by just showing the work off. Yeah. Show the work. Yeah. That's what I did. Do you think you kind of figured that out yourself or do you think I you figured that out myself? Mm -hmm. Interview for me was go lay the drawings on the table and the HBO movie Temple Grandin shows exactly how my mind works. Mick Jackson, the director, visual thinker, he absolutely understood that. Yeah. Yeah. Now the thing here, here's Stephanie has a question here about how do you help people not be so afraid of making mistakes? Um, I think it's getting back to doing more hands-on things. So the kid in second grade or whatever cuts a snowflake wrong and then you get another paper and you try it again. 
Mm -hmm. um, I think that's part of it. They're, they're totally, they haven't learned that you can learn from mistakes. So it's a paper snowflake you wreck. Um, uh, it was a sewing project with maybe today it might have had $25 worth of fabric in it. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, wrecking something really big, right. but I never forgot that. Yeah. 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 I think that's true. I think that, you know, allowing kids to fail and say, it's okay that you failed and you have, what do you learn from that? Well, I can remember our disastrous Kool-Aid stand when we were kids. I was maybe 10. My sister was eight and we ran out of sugar. And this is when you learn how much sugar's in Kool-Aid and it's really disgusting. <laughs> and so our second batch of Kool-Aid was really sour because we used half as much sugar. <laughs> so very well. Yeah, it's like four cups of sugar or something, right? It's awful. And we had this great big metal sugar canister that was about this big and it was half full. And for the first two pictures, we used all of it, almost all. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that you learned that is check your supplies and that Kool-Aid's not very healthy. No, it's not. It's not. Um, let's see. I was going to say. Um, I also I found a quote in your book that I really loved. And it's kind of toward the end. It says, I hope that the first experiences every child has of nature are like the ones I had growing up filled with wonderment and fun. Well, that's right. But the first thing you kids just got to do is go outside and go outside because now since I, you know, we're now uh, outdoor scientists is out, I've been becoming more aware of interesting things I'm seeing like the crow drinking out of the dirty puddle and he didn't like it or the squirrel mm -hmm. burning the nut. Yeah. And what the Canada geese are doing and where they hang out. Yeah. Why are they so mean? Well, she was protecting her eggs. Yeah. And so she'd hissed at everybody. But then my student made friends with her and she'd follow them around and land on the on the balcony railing. And then the apartment manager found out he was feeding them. <laughs> Maybe he should not have been doing that. Mm -hmm. But he still got along with them. They still landed on his his balcony railing. And he's got pictures on his phone of him coming in for full landing, land on the railing. Yeah. But she didn't, after then, when she had her goslings, she showed them off to them. But the one that was nesting underneath our front door of our building and everyone was walking in there, she hissed at everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, why would she nest under the front door of a campus building with lots of people walking under, under up the steps? You know, concrete steps. I don't know why she nested under there. Yeah. Let's see, we have a question. At what age did you feel you became more comfortable with your social skills? The thing with being autistic, you're always learning more. It's a gradual, gradual change. Now, one thing that helped me, and this is where 50s upbringing is helpful, because I've had a lot of granddads come up to me and tell me that they found out they were autistic when the kids got diagnosed. And granddaddy had that paper out. And um, the other thing that was done in our neighborhood in the 50s, real 50s thing, and I think it's a good thing, when the parents had parties, the kids had to put on their good clothes and greet the guests, shake hands, and serve the snacks. And then you sat at the table and you had dinner. And if I um, stirred my drink with my finger, mother would say, use the spoon, all that teachable moments. And grown-ups corrected children everywhere they went. Mm -hmm. and, and they did it. If you went over to the next-door neighbor's house, uh, if you were touching too much stuff in the stores, the clerks would go, you can only touch the stuff you're going to buy. Mm -hmm. uh, Grown-ups corrected kids, and it wasn't done in a mean way. Right. It, was, it was just giving the instruction. And then that grandfather with that paper route really early had learned how to work. So yeah. I know paper routes are gone, so we've got to replace it with something else, like a volunteer job at a church or walking a dog for the neighbor. Something mm -hmm. you do every day on a schedule outside the family. Yeah. Well, and it just sounds like you just became curious about your own mind and just learned more. And um, well, you, you keep learning. But the thing is, is that 
there's a social kind of chit chat that I'm not interested in. I'd rather talk about how they got the ship out of the Suez Canal. And then I think the container of bedroom slippers is funny. <laughs> I know it's real. Yeah. It's on that ship up. Yeah. Where? I don't know, but it is there. One truckload of bedroom slippers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I've had students ask me, I've had people in their 20s ask me, what would be in the boxes on the ship? And I go, really? You're asking that? Well, it came out of a Chinese report, so everything they would make there, electronics, lots of clothes. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, personal protective equipment would be on that. Yeah. Everything. Now, you wouldn't have, um, they wouldn't have perishable food on that boat. Yeah, that would be on it. Uh, well, there's sometimes they do refrigerated containers, but probably not on that trip. Right. But just everything, you know, manufactured stuff, uh, hardwood flooring would be on it. Yeah. Yeah. It all kinds of stuff. Right. It was billions what of. What happens on the ones that come over here in the container ships, like for backhauls? They fill those boxes up with grain and hay and send it back to China and they feed it the livestock. I am not kidding backhauls for electronics computers and phones grain and hay mm -hmm. yeah you don't want to send an empty box back no that's true okay we have a good question what is the single most important thing you can do for a child with autism well let's talk about age here all right if you've got a two and a half year old that's not talking you've got to get into some kind of therapy the worst thing you can do with little kids that are not talking, I don't care whether they have a diagnosis or not, is to do nothing. Make sure he's not deaf. That's the first thing. Then you got to get working on him. And again, I've talked to a lot of places where there's no services. If you can get good services, get them right into an early intervention program, two or three hours a day, working with an effective teacher. So what's an effective teacher? More words, more turn-taking, more interaction. Mm -hmm. and, and and a good therapist too. The kids are going to like you know going to therapy. So that's what we need to do with little kids. Um. Now where we're really falling down, I think sometimes with um with autistic like kids with an autism label is when they get older. See the problem is when they're literally you know I looked really severe when I was little. I had no speech until age four. Mm -hmm. uh, is is you've got such a big range. You're going from Silicon Valley computer programmer to maybe somebody who made something that's on the Mars rover. I found some of the vendors. I didn't find all of them. Mm -hmm. But I found out a lot about it. Each wheel is machined from a single block of aircraft-grade aluminum. Mm -hmm. You know, two or three people would have made those. Yeah. Maybe they use computerized milling equipment. Right. But that still is a very high-end skilled trade. Let's give it credit. Mm -hmm. I didn't find out they made every gear in the thing. And the gear yeah. company, very proud of that. Yeah. They're one of the employers that might you know, hire some autistic people because you've got to really make the gear, like to turn the camera or the steering. It has to be very, very precise. Mm -hmm. And and we need to be, there's not enough teaching of life skills. I'm seeing kids, I've seen, you know, PhDs get out of college, can't get a job, and they got no life skills. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was shopping at age seven. Yeah. I had an allowance. And I learned how to save money. Yeah. 50 cents a week could buy a lot of stuff in the 50s. Mm -hmm. I could get 10 comics. I could get, uh, no, five comics. Five comics, 10 candy bars. But if I wanted the 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. Yeah. I was learning that at seven and eight years old. That's not difficult stuff to do. Now it's at the dollar store. It's like $5. Yeah. It's the same idea. Mm -hmm. not learning this basic stuff. I can't believe the number of fully verbal kids that have never shopped. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like this book is has so many great ideas for kids with autism, kids that don't have autism. Well, just any, and just any kid. Any kids, um, yeah. And, and uh, the whole idea is we just got to get them out doing something. We'll say, well, there's nothing to do outside. Yeah. I've been really paying attention. I do a little quarter of a mile walk around my neighborhood, uh, just a apartment, townhouse neighborhood. 
and I most of the animal stuff I'm seeing is on the lawns and I watched a squirrel go across an entire electric wire. <laughs> Big long one. Yeah. Then he went down the pole and ran across the pool, so across the pool cover. Yeah, they're amazing. Well, I, I think it looks like we're trying to wrap up here. And Dr. Grandin, this book is amazing. I'm so glad you wrote it. Thank you so oh, much. I love it will be outdoor, <laughs> outdoor scientist. Be part of my classroom. I'm glad we managed to get logged on. I had a few little glitches. Yes. That's the thing that makes me the most nervous. Am I going to get to the airport on time? Is the computer going to do something weird? Logistics. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, thank you so much for your flexibility on hopping us on this awesome virtual event. Thank you both so much for this wonderful conversation. I know I've been jotting down notes and flipping through the book. Um, knowing that it's so important for not only us to get our hands dirty, but for to us to encourage the young people in our lives to be sitting down outside, seeing what there is to offer. Um, I will give a small anecdote. Just the other day in the classroom, one of my children was feeling kind of disheartened about a, a problem they were having with tracing a, one of the continents that we have as a map in the classroom. And one of their friends says, don't worry, mistakes are lovely. And that seems to be kind of the message that I'm hearing from you, Dr. Green, and that children, we, we well, need to have you learn to be more this careful. Is, because the reason why I cut the fabric wrong on a sewing project is that I was in a hurry. <laughs> yes, exactly. I had attention to what I was cutting. Right. Yeah. So thank you so much for all of these wonderful reminders. And thanks, everyone, to con for those of you who contributed a question in the comments. Um, I'm sure you saw on the banner underneath um, our live broadcast that you can be in touch with us over the phone on our Indie Light page um, to get yourself, or you can come in store. Um, we are open for you guys to get um, a copy of The Outdoor Scientist. You can snag a copy with a signed book plate from Dr. Grandin. Um, but again, thank you all for coming. Thank thank you for it's a genuine signed book plate. I sat on my sofa and I signed them. Oh, thank you so much. We're so okay. grateful. All right. So everyone have a great night and thanks again for coming. All right. Great to talk to you. I'm going to leave the meeting and um, thank you just so much. Thank you so much. All right.